All right, everyone. We're all settled. Great. Uh, my name is Mark. I'll be your chair for the next two sessions. Um, I'm a data scientist for a, a local strategy consulting firm. Really excited about these two talks. Uh, the first talk is going to be how to, about choosing the right deep learning framework. So uh, welcome Rikesh, uh, Rishikesh to the stage. Thank you, Mark. <coughs> so, hello to everyone. So, hope you all doing well. So, my topic for this uh, presentation is uh, guide to choose a right deep learning framework. And I choose this topic because, uh, as a data scientist, the most frequent question people ask me that which framework we are using for, or which for framework I am using for my AI project. And sometimes I'm suggest then okay you can use this uh, framework you can use that framework but later on they said that okay this is not compatible with my projects so today i am discussing that the key parameters which we are used to judge our project and as per that parameter we can decide that which uh, deep learning framework is better for me or uh, better for your project so the problem it arises that uh, which framework is better because uh, all the deep learning framework is not as mature as the other framework, uh, whether it's software framework or uh, database frameworks, because uh, deep learning is just a very uh, growing topic and uh, it is not a very mature right now. So let me introduce me first. So myself, Rishikesh, I am from India and I am working as a data scientist at Humanist Global. Apart from, apart from my job, I am contributed to many open source projects and here are some good projects which I have contributed. So uh, this is my GitHub, uh, you are, you are, uh, GitHub username and if you want to connect me, Telegram is the best option for that. So before set my tone for this uh, presentation, I would like to ask some questions and see that what is the level of uh, audience about this uh, talk. So the first question, how many have a uh, machine learning background here? So good. And how many have ever used any deep learning framework? Nice. And how many people use only one deep learning framework? Very less. So very less loyal people here. And the last one is how many of you contributed to any deep learning framework? Okay. So, so the outline of this uh, presentation is this. First, I try to explain the key points which is common to all deep learning framework and which help us to judge that framework. And the second one is to identifying your project, that uh, what kind of project you are working on and as per your project, you will able to decide your framework. The third one is the bottleneck uh, that every uh, deep learning framework have because as I earlier said it, they are all not mature yet. And the fourth is I gonna discuss the top three frameworks right now in the industry and explain that how you can evaluate those parameters on the given explained key point earlier. And the last one is the benchmark. Benchmarking is not as important, but uh, many people are w ask for benchmarking that okay, you can give me some benchmark for that. But for me, it is totally depends upon your project rather than benchmarking. So, here are some five points which we have to keep in mind whenever we are uh, selecting our deep learning framework or we have for our projects. The first one is easy of coding. Uh, many framework has very complicated way of coding and many one is very easy and we need to decide that which is why this is one of the most developer concern thing that how good is uh, I'm able and how much I'm comfortable to code in that framework. The second is the installation and support. And this is uh, one of the most headache of the any developer that you need to first install and installing a, any deep learning framework is kind of headache thing because you have to install some extra libraries like SCUDAs and other uh, BLAST libraries for that. The third one is the boilerplate example and community that is uh, helpful for the beginners to start, uh, get a good examples and the community support online. The fourth one is stability and scalability. It is much uh, scalability. It is much more the industry focus that whenever we are building our product and uh, we need to deploy it on a, any business scenarios, we need a stability of the product as well as the scalability to the high to higher range. 
And the last one is the speed of training and inference. This is much more research oriented that whenever we are doing research, we need a very uh, fast uh, deep learning framework so that you can done all your research in within a estimated time. So let me explain you what is the ease of coding and how we can evaluate our any parameter of ease of coding. The first one is the uh, minimum line of code for a complex algorithm. So deep learning is very complex and it is hard to understand some kind of algorithm. Uh, so everybody wants that they can implement any complex algorithms with a minimum lines of codes. And many frameworks providing those features and many out of the box functions which can just you can use just one function it will done all for you so this is the one of the major concern for developer that minimum line of code for get a maximum uh, output the second one the ease of uh, ease of use in terms of architecture architecture means that uh, every coding has a different architecture or majorly uh, the framework i'm talking about is much more related to python but uh, uh, the framework like TensorFlow uh, is a, not a Python help or Pythonic architecture. They are much more inspired from C++. So many, uh, many TensorFlow user who has code in Python is a pretty hard time to understand the basic architecture and basic flow of the uh, framework like creating session, managing placeholder, all these things. So it is very important uh, and, and uh, uh, just opposite to that PyTorch is kind of Pythonic uh, platform. So that is why most of the developer is migrating from TensorFlow to PyTorch because it is much more Pythonic than TensorFlow. The third is the deployment friendly. If I develop some code and we build any software, the major then the after uh, building any software, the first headache is to deployment. And deployment is a very uh, hectic task because even you write your code, you does not give any appreciation unless or until you are not deployed in the industry. So deployment friendly is very important. And uh, you, can uh, you can see this like the, uh, the much easier to deploy the code, the much shorter the software development cycle is. And coding fe uh, flexibility, this is much more researchers are looking for coding flexibility. Uh, many uh, deep learning framework is there who are not providing such uh, flexibility. They are giving you out of the box functions and you are using that. But if you are developing something which is never exist, you need a flexibility in coding. You need a very low level of coding so that you can implement any function whether it is present in your framework or not. So that is why coding flexi flexibility is very important mainly for researchers. And the last one, how many functions a method are out of the box. As I explained earlier, it is very important for a fast coding or devel uh, developing a uh, software in a minimum amount of time. You require uh, many functions or common functions out of the box. And the last one is a high level as well as low level APIs. Many people are good coders. They can code in many complicated uh, framework, but uh, many of us is not as much a good coder. They are required a high level APIs so that they can code easily and without any managing the memory, ma doing any kind of memory management or, or coding management. They just want to use uh, straight forward. So that is why if uh, you are uh, many, many uh, framework like TensorFlow, PyTorch has a very low level libraries, but they are also providing some high level APIs so that the person who are not in, not much into coding, they can ab able to easily write the code without any uh, coding, looking for them coding complexity. Okay, so one more is there is the debugging and logging. And this is very important for your uh, production ready software. You always try to track your improvement, try to track everything of your software, how it's behaving throughout the time. Because many of the algorithms are not yet to be known from inside how they are working. There are much more research is going on that how neural networks works and how it is better than any existing machine learning algorithms. So you need a good debugging system so that uh, in later on time, if something gone wrong, goes wrong, so you can able to identify where, is, where the things goes wrong. So debugging and logging is very important, mainly for production ready systems. So uh, the second is the installation and support. This is much more DevOps work. Uh, everyone wants a single hand and easy installation, but many frameworks don't provide this to all the users. Um, because uh, basically what happened that uh, more, more or less uh, all machine learning and deep learning framework is very, very computational, uh, means complex uh, computation hungry. And they are required a low level optimization, mainly in the hardware level. 
So for that, they required some low-level APIs, which is written in Fortran or C, or any low-level APIs like Blast or Intel MKL, these kind of libraries. So before installing your uh, any framework, you require to install those frameworks, which are up to provide a low-level uh, low-level optimization or hardware optimization. So for that, if you are not very coding personality or very uh, get into the system, you, it is very hard for you to understand these kind of nuances. So everyone wants a single line installation and they are throughout the time within two years I see that many deep uh, learning framework can understand this and they're providing out of the box solution you, you require to just write one pip command and they install every installation by themselves you don't have to bother about this thing and the second one is good documentation and as I earlier mentioned that the deep learning framework is, is still emerging and it is not uh, rich yet at saturation level so there are many research going on day to day and there are many frameworks comes day to day and if you want to get into any software you definitely require a very good documentation and because it is very fastest growing uh, industry or you can say research field they are very less de developer get very less time to end up to write any kind of documentation they require some open source community to for doing that so good documentation is very important especially for the person who is starting or just uh, try to start the any deep learning framework or any kind of framework, not only deep learning framework any framework it is good documentation is very important uh, OS support is also very important because more, more or less many uh, every deep learning uh, enthusiasm uh, enthusiast work on uh, Ubuntu but uh, there are many industry software who are run on Windows and I'd, uh, many companies are regret say that okay we don't uh, require two operating system we always have one, one operating system so it is uh, important that your framework is support every major operating system not only Ubuntu it can support uh, uh, Mac also as well as Windows or any other flavor of the Linux. So it is very important before you start your uh, using any kind of framework, you first see the what are the OS support is there. Uh, fourth one is the multiple language support. There are many programs we are written in different languages. Python has abundance of frameworks, but suppose I am I, I am I much love Java. I write to love uh, code in Java. My software is in Java. So I want to use TensorFlow in Java or PyTorch in Java and MXNet in Java and any other framework in the different languages. Uh, so Python has a vendors, but not all other languages has a very good uh, or sophisticated framework is there for deep learning. So I definitely required that my framework would be able to handle two, three languages without any kind of uh, writing extra code or anything. It is by uh, by natively they can support two, three languages just like as a client language, not not depend upon the core coding at least as a client language and the rest is the support of bleeding edge technologies as day by day there are many technologies are emerges whether it is docker or any other devops tools or any other uh, CUDA libraries there so day by day everything from hardware to software is emerging and I want that my framework is so flexible it can adapt and the community behind my framework is so flexible and so mature that they can able to code or make the framework adapted to any kind of bridging and technology who is emerging throughout the time. So it is very important at least for production uh, grade software, not only for, for production grade, for researcher also. Uh, if suppose some new CUDA libraries is there, I want that my framework support as soon as possible because the performance matters when it comes to deep learning and any machine learning task. And the last is hardware support. There are many uh, framework is there who can only support uh, GPU systems and many are only support uh, CPU system. But uh, I want that my framework, if my product is running on mobile or my product is running on some hardware like Raspberry Pi and some kind of custom ASIC alg alg hardware, I want that my framework is able to deploy any, not framework, the output of the framework is deployed on any kind of uh, devices, whether it is mobile, CPU, GPU, or multi-GPU, or distributed system, or either cloud. Now many, uh, if you see the top deep learning framework supports all. You can use TensorFlow model and deploy it on your mobile, Android mobile. You can use MXNet and deploy it anywhere, whether it's Raspberry Pi or any ASIC hardware. So from any, uh, there's no hardware limitation I required because my product can be any hardware, whether it is a normal ASIC hardware or whether it is mobile or whether it is a cloud or distributed system.
So these are the parameters we definitely looking into it if you are building a software which can support every platform. And this is much more starter uh, friendly or beginner's uh, uh, slides that when you start writing code in some kind of framework, the first one things you are looking for, uh, the framework, who built that framework? The person or the community behind that framework is so mature or not, or so good or not, can they can able to build the system or maintain that system. Even if you build a software, the building software is never be the hard task. Maintaining that software throughout the time and doing changes and adapt that uh, latest technology is very, very important and very, very crucial rather than building any kind of software. So we always looking at the persons or the community behind any framework, whether that they have such capability or not, they can able to back this software for a long time or they can provide us support for a long time. So it is very important and uh, it is much more beginner kind of stuff because as a beginner you don't see the how, how much user base any software have. You see the who built that software, whether that is built by Google, whether it is built by Facebook, whether it is built by GitHub, anyone. So you are always looking for the community or company or person behind that software or framework. The second one is kick start examples. So uh, if you heard about some new framework or some new software, framework, anything, you first looking for the examples that you want to build a neural network, you just go and see that, okay, how to build a neural network using Chainer, how to build a neural network using Keras. So if you find, if you find that good example within top two, three Google searches, you say, okay, that library is awesome. They have uh, very good resources. But if you are not, you totally discourage and say that, okay, that, uh, that framework does not have such a kind of user, uh, user base or they don't have much example. So later on time, I may be stuck somewhere. I don't find support uh, online easily. So kick start example is very important. And always you have to looking for that, how much resource and how much examples are there on the internet for using any kind of framework, whatever you are choosing. And the third one is a similar ability of tutorial and training materials. Uh, the fourth one is very important, active communities. Even though you find a good resource on internet or even a good example of build a, uh, your software, but there always be uh, something which you definitely miss and you require their help. So you're looking for active communities who are working on this framework from where you get your help. And majorly we are using GitHub, Slack, Gitter for getting help from those communities or join those organizations or communities and asking help from just like a PyData or PyCon. These are the communities for Python which can help us and for getting start or maybe wherever we stuck, we can discuss things in between the communities and find out the result easily. So active communities is very, very important, uh, majorly in the field of deep learning at least because it is a new field. It is not very mature right now. And this is much more industry focus, stability, and scalability. Maturity of framework is very important. Nobody wants to build their product with the pro framework which is just launched one month back. We do not have much more user base, and it is very hard to believe something which is just launched. So maturity is very important, and the much mature system and much more framework is there, the much more stability they, have, they can provide me. Back compatibility is very important if you are building a very long-term projects and long-term software which can stay there for 10 to 20 years. We always require a back compatibility from your software or uh, frameworks that it can support all the previous features, not natively, at least they can provide some kind of packages from there we can handle all the previous features. Frequencies release is very important for stability because in last one year, TensorFlow releases uh, 10 releases. They can release 10 uh, versions and it is very, in every version they can do something new. If suppose I learned TensorFlow one year back, if I open right now and start coding a TensorFlow with the latest version of TensorFlow, I have found very hard time to code and got very hard time to optimize my code or even coding is very hard right now because they are uh, so frequent uh, they are so frequent in release that we can't keep up with that not uh, so we always choose one best version okay this is the best and stable version i'm going to use for one year so frequency is release 
is determined by the things means how much uh, feature they are adding and how much uh, code they are they have changed because throughout a year i think there are many framework is totally changed their coding architecture and support some, uh, they support some good things but if if i learn something one year back or using tutorials one year back uh, uh, resources then it is useless for right now so it is very important to see the frequency of release one two release a year is good but uh, 10 to 15 releases a year is very difficult and number one uh, number of users is similar if you have a large community you have a large number of users the large number of users the big community it is and number of existing issues so this is also very important because uh, if you see and go to github and see the issue list of uh, tensorflow there are many useless issues but there are many good issues are also there you see there are 1500 existing issue around 1500 in uh, tensorflow github repo and in many of them is very good it is not just okay tell me how to, there is some installation problem is there something like this no there are many some serious issues there and you don't want that that serious issue is come to your product or in your or that uh, issues can hurt your research work so definitely before selecting any kind of framework you definitely see the open issues present in that framework because this is very important uh, for a major task it might be hurt your performance as well as uh, some kind of security flaw is also there so always looking for existing open issues and this is much more scalability you want that if you are deploy your system to a public you definitely want that your system is will highly scalable it can scale to very large distributed environment to very small single mobile so scalability is always important for a production ready system and i don't think that this i need to explain it is simple speed everybody want to see that their system is fast their product is fast so speed is well explain that okay you required the uh, framework which can train easily or fast than any other framework and you required a very less in inference time so here are some famous and top deep learning framework right now uh, chainer mx net cafe uh, microsoft cntk tensorflow keras glue pytorch theano keras and glue are somewhat high level apis they are not well versed itself they are using some backend uh, Mm, backend framework like uh, Keras use uh, Theano, TensorFlow, and CNTK, and Glue use CNTK and MXNet for their purpose. They are high, Keras and Glue as high level APIs. Other are low level and high level as well. So this is uh, so before selecting any kind of framework, you need to identify your scope of project. What kind of project you are looking uh, working on? The first one is the research project. If you are working on a research project, you definitely go for coding flexibility rather than any other uh, thing because you don't require a production grade system. You just need to do research. You are doing something which never happened or would be game changing or which is not exist yet. So definitely you require a coding flexibility, uh, flexibility so that you can write code from zero to thing which never exist. So coding flexibility is very important for research work. They don't require any kind of scalability. You can learn on a single system. So scalability and stability is much more for production grade or deployable product. But for research, as a research oriented project, you do, you, your first priority is a coding flexibility. The second is a small project or POC. So for a small project or POC, you generally we do a small project in a quick session. So definitely you require a high level API rather than low level API. So you can use Keras or Glue for that uh, because a small project is small. They are not production grade. You don't require a production grade. POC is never be a production grade. It is just you show that, okay, this thing can be happen. So definitely you require something very fast coding or you don't go down deep to the algorithms. You are just want to things get done. So for that, you can use high level APIs like Keras and Glues, or you can use with PyTorch, which is don't require any kind of high level, uh, high level libraries because it is always a very simple coding or read maintain readability throughout the coding. And from medial scale project, from here, the scalability, stability part come into picture. Uh, medium scale project is like a uh, service based project which you are building for a client which are not we think that okay these are the side project it is not a major product it's just helping the existing product so medium scale project for that you can choose any framework 
You can use Keras, you can use any kind of mature framework like TensorFlow and PyTorch. It is solely depends upon you. It is not uh, very major that you can you have to use a very big uh, frameworks or you have to use very sophisticated framework. It solely depends upon your requirement and business scenarios. And for large complex project, you definitely require a very sophisticated and highly uh, adaptable in environment. Uh, so basically, a uh, large complex project is for very high grade or very big uh, long term projects and which are solely depends upon AI. If your product is solely dependent upon AI, then you definitely go for large complex project. And for that, you are looking for a framework which provides you everything from logging to visualization to easy debugging, everything. Coding flexibility is also important. So you require each and every features top notch. It, it is highly scalable. It can deploy in any devices or means everything, whatever I explained earlier, you require everything for large complex project. So even though we have a, uh, frameworks, there, there are some bottlenecks exist to all the frameworks right now. The first one I explained earlier, the installation and dependency management is very hard, especially for deep learning projects, because it is run on very low level machines and they are working on very low level coding. So definitely you require many much uh, high hardware optimization software for that. So uh, installation and dependency management is very, very difficult right now for every framework right now. And hard to keep up with the latest development. As I explained earlier, TensorFlow releases 10, uh, 10 to 12 release in last one year. And if you are coding TensorFlow 1.0 and you want to migrate it to TensorFlow 1.11, it is very hard to you. You have to change many, you have to change many parameter or main many serious parameter also. So you have to be thinking about that. And it is very difficult right now for keep on with the latest development. So far, there is no at uh, standardization at all for frameworks. There's no fixed way to save your uh, uh, pre-trained models. And there's no way of saying that, okay, we can save my model into this or code like this and that. So there's no standardization at all right now in any other framework. There is one initiative called uh, Open Neural Network Exchange, which can build a model which can deploy to other framework also. But apart from that, uh, there is no standardization at all right now. And inconsistency in low-level optimization. If you are working on CUDA, CUDA 8, and you your software is you you I mean suppose your GPU support CUDA 9, so it is very hard to keep up with the performance. The program is running, is still running, but the performance you want, you never get. So it is very inconsistent right now for all deep learning framework. And yes, too much hardware dependencies. So let's see some common, we have, I pick out the three uh, frameworks for uh, just analyzing these things. Uh, TensorFlow is originally developed by uh, Google Brain. It is widely used for machine learning framework is there. If you ask any second deep learning uh, companies that which framework they are using, they definitely say I'm using TensorFlow. So it is very common and highly used uh, and very sophisticated framework. So it is backed by excellent and large communities and adequate, it has adequate documentation online resource and it support probably all the machine learning and deep learning algorithms out of the box. And yes, it is a production ready framework. It has provided you visualization, good logging system. Debugging is pretty difficult, but throughout the time they can maintain it. Uh, they can improve the uh, de debugging. And here are some more uh, pros for TensorFlow. It is provide a high-level APIs like Keras, written in C++. They can support many client languages like Python, Java, Go. And yes, this is important that uh, uh, TensorFlow is inspired from Theano, and Theano support a static graph. So you have to write first, then run, rather than uh, define by run. You have to first explain everything. The graph is static, and it's the biggest drawback of TensorFlow. But uh, from after TensorFlow 1.7, they support a eager education, uh, execution. From that, uh, they uh, support a dynamic graph, uh, so that you can define your graph on Go, on and runtime. So it is good, but it's still yet to be sophisticated. And yes, TensorFlow deploy on Android mobiles, and it has a good visualization tool like TensorBoard. In TensorBoard, you can track your model improvement and see that whether model is going to saturate or not. So it has a very good visualization tool and 
logging system. So if everything is good with TensorFlow, so any other reason to look at the frameworks? So as I mentioned in beginning that TensorFlow is less Pythonic. It is discouraged Python uh, pro programmer and majorly with the people who are working on a machine learning or deep learning framework, they, they are all Python, Python programmers. So, and if they are using a framework which is less Pythonic, it's totally discouraging to them. And I found one quote from internet that is this. For researchers, TensorFlow is hard to learn and hard to use. Research is all about flexibility. Lack of flexibility is back, uh, baked into a TensorFlow at a deep level. So it has very less flexible uh, framework than PyTorch, Chain, or uh, MXNet. And because they are defining some different kind of architecture, you have to define a session, you have to have managing placeholders, variables. These are very not very Pythonic way of doing things. So, so let's look out the next. Next is the PyTorch, and it is a very Progressive, you can say. Many researchers are looking for PyTorch, and it is becoming a superstar in the field of deep learning framework right now. So it is primarily developed by uh, Facebook Artificial Intelligence Lab and Uber Pyro. It is pure Pythonic approach. It does not have some extra, I uh, means uh, framework specific things like a session, tensor board, uh, uh, sorry, tensor placeholder, and variable like. Uh, uh, like uh, TensorFlow, it has purely Pythonic, uh, and you, if you code in that PyTorch, you feel that you are code in Python. Not uh, you don't require some kind of extra knowledge or extra things. And yes, it supports a dynamic computational graph, so it is very easy and flexible. Uh, it is research friendly. No need to high level APIs like Keras, as I earlier mentioned. PyTorch is very simple to code. They maintain readability throughout the coding, and it is simple to learn. It is support a symbolic programming also. You can write A plus B and it will sum up the things. But TensorFlow does not, earlier did, uh, don't support this thing. And it is buttery smooth debugging. You can use uh, Python debugger and normal debugger also for debugging. It is, uh, and it is the best framework for debugging. Uh, it do not have very good logging system or visualization tool, but it is good for debugging. And the con is there, it is less mature. It is only two year old. And it is not production ready yet, but the, in earlier in this May, in this year, May 2018, Facebook announced that, okay, they can, from uh, PyTorch 1.0, they support a production ready system. So it is in their roadmap. And if you see their roadmap, they are very intuitive and it is good. And yes, it is lack like the visibility tool like TensorBoard, which is present in TensorFlow, but uh, PyTorch can integrate with TensorBoard also. And yes, it do not have mobile support yet. And scalability is also a very big problem for that because PyTorch is not as scalable as TensorFlow and MXNet. And the last framework I am discussing today is the MXNet, and this is very less popular and underrated. It is supported by Microsoft and Amazon, and it have lab, it it can, you can use it with multiple languages like C++ to Python, Java, and R. Sorry for Java, JavaScript, Go, and R. So it is a multi-language framework. And it is the fastest one. MXNet is a very fast and faster than any other framework when it comes to training and inference. So it is fastest in all the frameworks right now present in the uh, deep learning domain. And it is highly scalable and production ready. Uh, uh, MXNet is the framework by choice on Amazon, AWS. So if you are working on AWS, they can pro provide MXNet natively. They also support other frameworks, but MXNet is their uh, deep learning by choice, uh, deep learning framework by choice. Yes, MXNet has a glue, just like uh, Keras for TensorFlow. Glue is a very high level API and it is highly, it means coding friendly, coder friendly, you can write, uh, very large complex code in a very few lines of code. So glue is very good uh, for beginners or if you want to write a code in a very small amount of time. And MX, MXNet is highly scalable. It can scale to multi GPUs to multi system. It is very distributed. Uh, it is run, run on very large distributed environments. And the, the one of the most advantage of MXNet is that it can deploy anywhere from mobile, to a standard specific hardware. It can deploy anywhere. The cons is 
lesser user base, it is very underrated uh, framework right now, and a small community. And here are some benchmarking. So if you see the GitHub repo of TensorFlow, MXNet, and PyTorch, you see the star as well as fork. This way you can say that how many users are using uh, TensorFlow and how popular it is on GitHub. So this way you can say that, okay, TensorFlow is uh, much more mature than any other two. Then it comes to uh, PyTorch who have 20,000 stars and then MXNet. This is the one of the parameter for saying that it, whether it is mature or not or good, for, uh, which is the large user, user base, but it is not the only parameter. It is the one of the parameter. And here are some performance measures. I do not put, uh, I only put two performance measures, not very, very ma too many performance measures because it is totally subject to the hardware and the version you are using. So this is on uh, a stable version like TensorFlow, I use TensorFlow 1.6, PyTorch 0.4, MXNet 1.2, uh, and that is run on AWS. By default, AWS give you KAT and CUDA 8. So this is, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this benchmarking on those uh, specification. And here is another one. You see MXNet is fast in both, but uh, it is not always the case. In some, uh, in some times TensorFlow outperform MXNet uh, and PyTorch perform other two. It is so totally subject to the optimization and how much they support the hardware. So that's it from my talk. So you can contact me here and if anybody have any question, please shoot. Great, thanks so much. I was um, sitting here trying to think of some good questions for the Q&A and you, you actually answered all of them in your presentation. So well done, that was very holistic and comprehensive, great talk. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? I'll maybe, yeah, there we go. John, will you get it? Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, on ONNX, on ONNX, um, it seems like a great thing and it will free us from being dependent on particular vendors, but it's really only, well, it's everyone but Google that supports it right now. So you can go from PyTorch to um, Cognitive CNTK um, and to MXNet. Do you know if there's any plan to be able to interoperate with the uh, TensorFlow ecosystem with it? Uh, I don't think so. They are planning for that. I'm not sure because uh, that is totally depends upon then whether they want to support or not. And then if they aren't, which they probably aren't planning on mm. doing that, um, what's your view on being sort of locked into the TensorFlow ecosystem versus if you use any of the others, you have a lot more options in deployment or moving to yeah, other systems. Okay. So uh, whenever I code in TensorFlow, I feel like this. That's my, someone wrapped my hand. Uh, they are not give you much more flexibility. Now they are supporting it, but uh, earlier they don't do. So that is why more and more people looking for other framework also. They're like uh, PyTorch is not there at that point of time in two years back when I started uh, using or try to code. So at that point of time, there's very less framework, but right now we have a lot of frameworks and TensorFlow has a different kind of defined, defined language. If you say, if you w work on MXNet or PyTorch, they are much more uh, Pythonic kind of thing. You can write a thing, but TensorFlow adds some extra, you can say, extra thing to the Python. That is like session. You need to maintain the session. You need to maintain a graph, all these things. And more or less, if you are a coder, if you see the session, you are totally, what is this? You need to learn extra things for that. And one more thing is that, that TensorFlow is growing. It is very big uh, framework and it is kind of, you can say it is framework by choice for the industry to use because they have very large user base. But they are not uh, as flexible as uh, PyTorch or any other open source community. Even though TensorFlow is open source, I feel like it is not 100% open source. The more over the decision, because I try to co contribute on TensorFlow, I see that 
more or more or less the decision making is the Google persons who are working on coldly working on that and they sometimes reg uh, reject you or whatever you suggest to them. So ONS, uh, ONS is a very good initiative because I, as I say there is no standardization right now for a deep learning world. We need a standardization. Without a standardization we are not say going for a long. We need to maintain and set the boundaries and set the things okay everything going into this way and currently uh, nearly there are many framework who have uh, start supporting ONS but TensorFlow in their path or roadmap they say that okay they did but uh, I don't know with the latest development whether they want to support or not but TensorFlow is a kind of different defined language rather than any other framework there might be some other framework I'm talking about the popular frameworks because which I have been working on. Okay. Thank you. Great. Does anyone else have any questions? Hi. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I'm not really an expert in the field, but I was wondering um, how big of a like competitive advantage for a framework is um, it being supported by like a cloud support a cloud provider. Um, is that very important? Are lots of data scientists using these? services built by like Google Cloud or AWS? Mm. Uh, it is if you are doing something from my own because many industries just like uh, for example banking industry banking industry does not want to use cloud they say okay I want a in-house system because security is a very very important measure so uh, there are many cloud providers is providing security but there are some industry or the other things we want in the closed environment and I want that hundred percent I control that thing if you are using some in-house uh, machine learning algorithms that like Google Cloud ML or AWS have their own uh, uh, machine learning libraries to support the cloud. So it is a similar thing. You are relying on someone else. You want to build something from your own. You want to control by your own or you want to deploy in, in, in your own house, means in-house systems. For that, uh, uh, machine learning is, you can say it is a kind of growing field. There every day some new optimization, some new algorithms is pops up in each and every day. Even this talk of 45 minutes, I think there are thousands of research people already published. So for keep up with that, you need to build an in-house system so that you can adapt the things. You don't say if you are using LSTM, suppose, on Google Cloud, you cannot say that, okay, if, you, if some new variant of LSTM is pops up, Google Cloud is not ready to support earlier. If they are take time testing it and do some kind of test, then they can host this kind of things. But if you are an in-house system or you want to see the result right the way, you can write the code. If you're a good coder, you write the code. Or you can use some other libraries which can support it that. And inspire from a write a code, inspire from other libraries, and do it by your own computer. So it's always be good if you are uh, able to build an in-house system and how write an in-house code rather than rely on some cloud system because many industries restrict that. Okay, thanks. Great, thanks. Uh, we started a bit late, so we're a bit squashed for time. I think if there's any other questions, I'm sure Rishikesh wouldn't mind chatting to you afterwards. Um, so let's give him another round of applause and say thanks. Thank you.